Hello, everybody. So we are very lucky today because on stage we have uh, three uh, great speakers, and uh, especially I want to thank everybody from uh, being here and being interested in this uh, in this uh, groundbreaking uh, revolution coming. Uh, we have on stage Dale, Dale Dogerty from um, Make Magazine, the founder of Make Magazine. So thanks very much, Dale, for being here with us. Uh, Peter Troxler from the um, Rotterdam University of Applied Science. And Thomas Diaz, uh, the founder of the manager sorry, of the um, Barcelona uh, Fab Lab. Um, uh, in, in the uh, University of... Uh, sorry. Yeah, the Institute of uh, uh, Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. Sorry for that. So I would like to start uh, with a, with a, a question, since uh, we have noticed that uh, on the media we are now having uh, much coverage about this uh, this new revolution. The economists, like more than one year ago, the one year ago had uh, a long special. On, on this topic, so my first question is, is for, for Dale especially, and is how did we move from the DIY uh, community to the new industrial revolution? So how did we uh, did we uh, pass from from this uh, you know this very common uh, thing of uh, do it yourself to this uh, promising revolution? How, how was this shift? Well. It's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer. Uh, I, I think the the thing for me, I mean, just to, as a way of framing this, I, I think what making has done is is something we did with computing, which was we made it personal and we made it something that everyone can do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really, I'm not so fond of the new industrial revolution things. I don't know really what we mean by that in, in all cases. Um, because I think industry has been a laggard in this, not a leader. And I think what we've seen in terms of almost a renewal of artisan and craftsmen uh, and, and uh, a, a lot of folks doing this personally um, is that the tools are changing and they are um, everything from you know, Arduinos to 3D printers, uh, giving people new opportunities and sense new building blocks for creating things and making things. And I think that the change here, and this is why I fight the word industrial, is, is that small scale manufacturing can be uh, a product of one. It can be something where you, you make a custom product like an artisan would for uh, a single use. And that might sound like art, but if we bring it back to sort of something like medicine, where one of the areas that, that you're seeing a lot of uses of 3D printing is something like prosthetics. And if you think about an industrial version of prosthetics might be small, medium, and large. Let's see which one kind of fits. Mm -hmm. But the 3D printed version can be precisely measured and fit to that person. And so you don't think about making you know, thousands of limbs. You think about making one at a time. So I, I think that grounding it in sort of the personal um, uh, is important here, and it's expanding the capabilities of people to become producers. So, um, actually, uh, you, you, you are more uh, focusing our attention on, on a, a parallel uh, movement instead of uh, the industry adapting to these new uh, opportunities. So, my, my, my question that maybe uh, we can add to, uh, to Peter um, is uh, how really is this uh, an alternative or it's a complement of the um, uh, industrial uh, approaches that we are used to see? So how uh, these new opportunities that the digital fabrication is, is giving us and the open manufacturing is, is giving us, how this will complement or become an alternative to the uh, you know, classical approach to, to industrial manufacturing? Well, I mean, uh, the, the kind of touches on, on that topic of industrial revolution, which you're, which you're not fond of. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of always putting kind of the, the, the manufacturing aspect a little bit on the, uh, on the back if, when we're talking industrial revolution. We just heard that presentation about uh, um, how consumption changes. Um, and there are a lot of these kind of changes that came along through this shift in mainly the communication system we're using. We, we were used to 
consume uh, media and consume communication that was sort of facilitated from a central um, point, from a central organization. Uh, with, with the arrival of the internet technology, that fundamentally changed. So that basically, um, in the area of communication, um, everybody was empowered to participate. And on top of this uh, information empowerment, a lot of changes happened. We've seen it first in, in encyclopedia and, and in newspapers, where Wikipedia is now the, the number one encyclopedia. Nobody has got a, a, a Britannica at home. Uh, well, I do, but I don't use it. Um, we've seen it with newspapers and uh, the arrival of bloggers and, and newspapers slowly shifting into that area of blogs. We've seen it in, actually in TV, where um, TV stations now turn to YouTube to find the most recent footage of, of, of groundbreaking events. Um, I don't need to cite the, 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 the Boston bombing, mm -hmm. uh, but there are many, many examples of that. And uh, this, kind of, this, this shift uh, in, in communication technology impacts not only on media, but it starts now to impact on manufacturing. And that's that helps to, to revive uh, what you, Dale, named that, that um, area of the artisan. Um, at the same time, another technological shift is happening. I mean, in, in industry, we had numerically controlled machines for ages, for decennia. I used to work in industry in the 90s and was kind of combining robots with big milling machines and automatic tool changers. That was then uh, a two million euro project. But these days, the technology we use there, computer-aided design, computer-controlled uh, uh, machines, have become much more easy to operate and much more affordable for everybody. Connected then to that communication uh, infrastructure and that idea of people empowered and uh, acting in more like peer-to-peer -peer fashion, what we call lateral power instead of hierarchical power. That then, um, in combination, is about to revolutionize how we think about manufacturing. And that's where I come back to your question. Um, there is another paradigm of industrial-like manufacturing emerging through people who are, as individuals, connected in a network, rather than working in a, in a, in a hierarchically, centrally organized industrial structure. Now, the big question, uh, obviously, is, um, is that going to fundamentally displace industry? Are the BMWs and, and uh, the IBMs and, and uh, all the big uh, manufacturers of, of, of this world, are they disappearing? Um, what's happening to global logistics, where we're so used to get everything and anything from China? Um, and I think we have to see that development again in a wider perspective. Imagine 25, 30 years from now, there will be 10 billion people on this planet. And we in the Western world who are thinking we're sort of the kings of this planet and uh, um, we know how society has to function and we want to teach the rest. We will be one billion. That's only 10% of world population. And other countries have seen that Brazil is, is a, a, an extreme hotspot in terms of innovation, in terms of responding to social challenges. China probably will be the next to come up with their own answers to societal problems. And then there's an awful lot of potential in Africa, which we're not aware of at all at the moment. And I think that's going to impact on how industry works. And it might then be absolutely necessary to have those peer-to-peer -peer production networks to manufacture our daily goods. But that's a speculation. OK, but th that's, that's great. You know, you, you touched that many points, so I just want to build a, a little bit upon this, and uh, you actually mentioned the resources and decentralization and peer-to-peer, -peer. so maybe this is a good question for, for Thomas. 
how this uh, new paradigm is going to happen. So in terms of uh, what kind of infrastructure do we need? Uh, is the garage or is the fab lab, is the tech shop? What's, where this is going to happen? Well, I, I think that mainly it's the combination of all of them. I, I really don't like when, when some people differentiate what, it, what is a fab lab or a hacker space or a maker space. I think we're part of, we're in the same boat in a way. So I think it's a combination of, of many things. Also, as, as Peter mentioned um, before, it's also the, the combination with other things that are not controlled within these networks of, of distributed manufacturing. And communications is very important because if we compare to, I mean, 700 years ago, the invention of the press really changed it. It was the opening of the Renaissance. No? Many people talk about today, about we are in the, in the, the beginning of a second Renaissance. No? And I think it's a, it's a beautiful way of describing what is happening. I can, I can give you examples, no? and, and, and also I can give you like kind of ambitions. The example is that uh, seven years ago, when I, I had the challenge to start the Fabla Barcelona, uh, we were like four fab labs in, 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 in that moment, four or five fab labs. And you were really like trying to get people to the fab lab to convince them and you know, you have to see this, this is the thing. And you were really running behind the people and now we are trying to kick out people of the fab lab. And we have 160 fab labs all over the world connected through internet and you know, having more or less the same equipment and being part of this, no? Another thing is that um, it was very, it was for a chance that in Barcelona, um, the people that founded the institute, and furthermore the Fab Lab, they got into the government, and now they are running the city. And, and now we are starting the Fab City project, and we are opening two new Fab Labs with the city council uh, at the end of the year. And the vision of the city council is that the Fab Labs should become a public service itself. And a public service may be similar to a library. No? We, we can talk about like, the new libraries of the future could be the Fab Labs no? or, or, or an addition to the libraries. If the library is incorporated in some moment, the computers to the books, then maybe the next step is to turn that information that you can find in a library into atoms. No? And the thing is that we are, I think we're far away of this uh, replacing industry. I think we are in the, that will happen a, proce um, a process in which it will complement the, the, the industry. We will not produce uh, bolts and nuts in the fab labs or, or things that, you know, that, that don't make sense to be produced in fab labs or, or in maker spaces or with, or with 3D printing. No? But I think that we are in this, in this process in which we, we are more like a diffusion and divulgation and, and also like a, more importantly, we, are, we really need to have like a new literacy in people no? because um, kids need to learn how, how to model in 3D, kids need to learn how to program in different languages, and they are doing so. It's so it's a cultural the, stuff. Exactly. So we need to set the, the, the common ground and, the, and, and, and for what is going to happen, which I think is not, the future is not going to be uh, houses filled with, uh, filled with 3D printers. We are running, we will be, the future will be digital materials and programmable matter. That would be something else, but we should be ready to understand that we can produce the things by ourselves. So the technology now is just, you know, the mean for something. But really what we are going is to really change, the, the important thing about this is, is the mindset. What, what's your experience in, the, in terms of uh, cultural exchanges happening into Fab Labs? So is there, uh, the Fab Lab, is, is a Fab Lab a place where we are building not only objects but also culture and shared the visions? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you can, for instance, in our Fab Lab, maybe, I, I don't know how many nationalities we have and you can find all over the world, but I mean, you, you can see how, how they, they are built like um, stronger relationships than the human machine, no? <laughs> the human mm -hmm. machine is part of a, of a formula, but really what it makes it exciting is, is these people, you know, an architect talking with a, co a programmer and then an artist talking with a, a guy that cannot talk to people because he's coding all the day and they end up doing something amazing at the, at the end of the day and, I don't know, uh, or inventing something. So, that's the, the important part, no? And, and, and also, I, li I like something that, that we usually say, and, 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 and I don't relate it only to manufacturing, but we say that we know the people, uh, we are people that we know each other because the things we do, we do not because the things we say we do. Yeah. No? So in a way, it's, it's, a, it's a place where things happen. It doesn't matter, it just, it, cannot, it doesn't, a 3D print, it's not just a 3D printed object, but it's, you know, maybe you, a beer, or maybe yeah. something else, no? So, yeah. 
Yeah, this you know, obviously obviously this reminds me a lot of uh, you know your your work with the Maker Fair and because you're not just creating a brand, it's just creating a, a, a I would say an ecosystem of events and people meeting a magazine and uh, cultural exchanges really. So uh, I would like to ask you, uh, Dale, um, what's the role of the uh, humanization part in this process? What's the role of the human relationships? Uh, when you when you have a maker fair, there is one coming up in Rome very soon. The first big maker fair in Europe will be in October in Rome. And what should, what we uh, can expect from an event like that? And what's the role of the social interaction in that? In building also well, in building the sure. vision. I mean, you know, I, I think part of uh, maker fair has simply been to kind of flush out all these people that are in a community so that they get to know each other. Uh, and it, almost as uh, Tomas was saying, in a way that's sort of more meaningful than just we emailed each other. And it, you do want to, s I think the core of Maker Fair for me was to create a conversation space between people who make things and others that want to learn about how they made it. Uh, just uh, put an object out there and say, this is what I do, and to be able to talk about that, as opposed to just talk about yourself or talk about something in general. Uh, and. And I think it has, has been a catalyst for bringing people together and identifying. And I think the important thing Maker Faire has done, perhaps better than uh, like the magazine even, is to be very inclusive and open for different kinds of making. We can include traditional forms of making as well as uh, what we might call advanced manufacturing. And seeing those connected and, and seeing those people that have the skills, the knowledge in those areas, um, I, I think leads to a kind of mashup of, of, of ideas and skills that lead to new products and, and new practices. Um, so I, I think that one of the beliefs I have is that, that or particularly around Maker Faire, is that this making exists in all communities. I sort of gave it a name but it didn't, I didn't create it. it, I didn't even force it, it's already there. But what the name helped to do was, was sort of get us out of our narrow you know, slice and say, yeah, I'm connected to something that's, that's bigger, I'm a maker. But, but part of something, yeah. Right, you could be doing embroidery or robotics, but to see that you know, we have in common a vocabulary around projects and the idea of you know, what are you doing, what are you working on is something that we can share. And I think back to your original point, I, I think that the, the, there's still a lot of growth here. I think maker spaces and fab labs, I would agree at times, whatever we call them, um, it, it's a very powerful idea because I think the space itself is, is persistent in the way, like, say, the event comes and goes. We can't have a maker for every weekend. We'd be exhausted. But the maker space is a, is a really important adjunct to that, to bring people together. And I think the, the Barcelona example is really fascinating of can we, can we put it in every neighborhood? Um, we don't just want one of these in a city. Uh, and that's why I've been sort of advocating getting them into schools and libraries, uh, places where people just show up not even knowing that they're makers, and then they see that they could do something. So it really, uh, I, but I, I think the growth for us is if we can build networks to collaborate, uh, uh, that, that's really how we move, say, beyond sort of the DIY in, into something w which has maybe the scale of, of the Industrial Revolution. But I would tend to, just, just to harp on my thing, I would tend to think of this as another creative revolution in, in the way that you know, like laser printers gave us the ability to create on a computer and to print out something. It brought a whole new group of people into computing that never thought it was important before because they weren't, you know, numbers people. They were graphic artists and, and uh, 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 you know, producers of like newsletters and magazines. So I, I think some of this technology is inviting new people to come in and, and, and use it in new ways. And uh, what's your experience in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, does this conversation happening in these events, uh, for example, embed uh, some part of critics uh, respect to the consumption patterns? So maybe um, is, is these people just showing up and sharing what they do creatively? Or this is also, there is also another level of discussion, in, in including 
you know, critics in terms of uh, the consumption patterns and uh, how to think about uh, we, how we will produce and consume our stuff in the future. Um, yes, but I, I think it, I see making not driven a whole lot by ideology. <laughs> like, like <Yeah. laughs> I think it's driven by sort of satisfaction and exploration, and, and it, but it leads into ideas and leads into, uh, uh, say, a, a, a different worldview, you might say. Um, you know, when I saw the previous talk, I was thinking, you know, thinking, you know, the way you're using collaborative consumption, I would use collaborative production as a yes. term. You know, how, how are people connecting around making things and seeing a network of people making things? We already have that in ways, and I think actually a lot of strong companies look at, I mean, just look at um, traditionally like what third-party developers are in an in a ecosystem. Um, it isn't just what a company makes, but it's how they enable a bunch of other people to make things, um, develop things, and, and sell them. So I think you'll, you'll begin to see that. And I think you're seeing that a little bit around markets. I mean, Etsy and others are certainly those kind of cooperative selling things. I think maybe the, the downside of some of those is um, some of the, what you might call them aggregators or market makers, are um, they get such a large share of the pie relative to the people that create. Um, I, I still think that looks a lot like traditional forms of, mm -hmm. of distribution where uh, uh, you know, the power really isn't very much in the, in the producer's hands, it's in the distributor's hands. Mm -hmm. I just definitely want to have your opinions, guys. Maybe yeah. Thomas has something to say. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to maybe disagree a little bit and say, like, um, I think there's a lot of ideology behind all of this, no? And I think there's a lot of, um, how do you say, like a very strong political position about what is really about, what is really this about making your own stuff, no? I totally agree about the freedom of, uh, we need to keep that freedom, and, and this is what I, some, somehow I like, um, I would say, I, I like the freedom that you have in maker spaces of, you know, do whatever you want. You, you have it the same in the Fab Labs. But I, I have to say that we, we need to think at the same time, for instance, if we feel uh, the world of Fab Labs and maker spaces, we have laser cutters and we have uh, ABS and PLA 3D printers. I mean, all the, you know, you know how much, how bad is the whole, all the acrylic and plywood and the ABS and the PLA that we're printing? It, 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 we don't think about, I mean, how I can connect, you know, a plastic, uh, a, a, a trash of plastics with a 3D printer. And mm -hmm. that's a very strong declaration of position. Uh, then it doesn't make sense uh, to do it. No? And at the same time, if I, if, I ha if I have a makerspace in a community and th this community doesn't have internet and I cannot produce something that could solve that problem, then what I'm doing this for? No? And not only individual satisfaction and the community of maker satisfaction, but the broader aspect of, of satisfaction or, or problem solving, no? local needs. I think in that way, we need like a very strong political or, or, or uh, ideological position, what, why we are doing this. It's not only about doing you know, robots that you know, turn on and off while your clap or something, but I think that really we need to turn those things into significant things. Otherwise, it will, it, we will keep being hobbyists. No? And then it, in that way, I think that we would will, we will be lost, losing the opportunity to be a real revolution. No? So, uh, maybe, uh, Peter, do you, do you, you can give us some glance of how the resources will actually, the resource discussion will actually end up in uh, influencing this. I'm thinking of, for example, thinking of a decentralized manufacturing process that embeds things like um, uh, resource, uh, I would say, mat mat material invariant design so that you can maybe produce stuff with the materials that you have at hand, you know, uh, in your place. Or maybe, um, I don't know, this kind of stuff. So how the the rest, the limited resources will actually impact this new infrastructure of decentralized production. Well, I guess um, what, what we're seeing right now is starting to happen. And uh, I mean, you're, you're starting your Green Fab Lab in Barcelona pretty soon. Um, we're looking into a project called Perpetual Plastic, which actually takes that idea of using, reusing your trash instead of throwing it out, putting it into a shredder, and, and create your own uh, raw materials to work with. Um, you know, one thing strikes me all the time in these discussions about sustainability and, and you know, material use, and of course the materials that we use are not the best, etc. 
But imagine you spend, say, a Saturday afternoon shopping, or you spend a Saturday afternoon making. You probably use 10 or 100 times more energy and natural resources when you're shopping compared to when you're making. So I would say making is, in a way, inherently sustainable. That does not take away that we need to look at the materials and that we need to, to find ways to get even more sustainable, to reuse stuff. Um, an important thing there, and that came up in, in, in your argument about the, the selling platforms and, and uh, in, in your argument about being political, the political statement there is, um, I believe, that we have to do it ourselves. It's not going to happen that some university professor like me comes and tells us, hey guys, now please turn into sustainable. It has to come from the inside, such as this, 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 this sales mechanism, these, these sharing mechanisms have to come from the inside. Also, how we organize ourselves, that has to come from the inside. Um, we've tried it in the Fab Lab movement several times to sort of impose some kind of organization that brings together all those people. And you do it with your maker fair. You're not commanding people to, to go there. You're creating a platform where they can take part. So I believe and that's really the, the, the political message about the making is that we not only make stuff, we make a new reality. And that means making citizenship taking responsibility for ourselves, for what we do, for what we produce. The whole discussion about 3D printing of guns starts and ends there. It's taking our own responsibility, and that's, a, that's an extremely political statement, and that's a political statement that probably some of those who rule our countries don't like that much. That, that, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. That's interesting because this kind of closes the circle, you know, because when you have access, you actually have people, uh, you know, no, no more only companies. And when you have communities and people, the sustainability of thinking uh, comes like inherently, as you did, as you mm, said, because actually when you have, when it's us doing stuff, we actually think about the, <laughs> the results that, that the stuff that we make have on our own life. So I, I guess that this is a good, Good closure. I need to make a, a footnote because you were clapping. Um, the danger is that we here are preaching to the converted, that we're all consenting mm -hmm. nerds who believe in that brilliant new future. The real challenge is to go out there and, and drag along those people who are not yet coming to our labs and to our make affairs yeah. to convince the rest of the world that this is really the way to go. And this resonates a lot with the inclusion stuff that you mentioned, yeah. actually. And I would like to have, we have six minutes more. Since uh, we put a lot of stuff on the table, I would like to have, uh, to know if some of you have some question. Is there any question from the audience? Okay. Can you? Uh, hello. Um, I'm wondering if this uh, is already uh, a revolution or big evolution in, in terms of numbers. Uh, I know it is in terms of publicity and attention that these ideas get, but do we, are there any figures about how big this really is? Yeah, well, as I said it before, uh, I think that we are not yet, we are not getting the numbers of a revolution. We have we are more in a like a, as you said in a media coverage of a revolution, maybe you have bigger numbers than us, <laughs> maybe. But um, as I said, in seven years, we have gone from zero to 150. And then, you know, maybe next year we will, we will be doubled in terms of fab labs in the world. Uh, in the Netherlands, there is one, uh, one fab lab per uh, 100,000, every 100,000 people, no? So if these kind of numbers reach to other countries or to or through, let's say to into a major um, 
regions and countries. Uh, yeah, maybe we can be talking about a revolution that maybe is not an industrial revolution, but maybe an educational revolution, I think. I think that we st we are first building the, the educational revolution, and this is why it's so important that to get into libraries, into schools, and really, you know, make this as a you know, common tool for everyone. As kids today, they, they cannot live with a, without a computer, no? Yeah, I, it's, that's why, what, you know, I, I was arguing with the word industrial, not you can argue with the word revolution because somehow we want these things to be quick and instantaneous. And I started the magazine nine years ago. The first Maker Faire was eight years ago. I mean, relatively speaking, that's a short period of time, but when we talk about internet trends, it looks like a long period of time. So I, I think where, I look at things like Maker Faire, it's, it's spread by word of mouth. It's it, 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 as much as media, it has spread because it resonates with people. Um, I give this example, uh, around the same time that I started Maker Faire, I gave the word Web 2.0 out to, you know, kind of signal a new generation of web development. And that's come and gone. I mean, it's in the rear view mirror. Um, but in some ways it was a meme, it just applied to kind of like a business argument. Whereas I feel like making applies to something very personal and it, and it is more inclusive and it connects to a lot more things. Who knows? I mean, I, I can't predict where it's going, but you can see the rapid growth um, uh, of it. And, and kind of the depth is what matters to me, not just the fact that people know what it is, but it, it is connecting to people that way. I, I like a sentence from Bob Mr. Fuller that says that it takes 50 years for, technology, for a technology to be truly transformational. So we think we're talking about truly, that's what? truly trans transformational. Yeah, yeah. It takes 50 years. We t we're talking about the, today about machines that were invented in the 50s. It's, it's taking even more. No? Internet was invented in the 70s, was DARPANET at the, the beginning. So mobile phones maybe, I don't know, at the beginning of the 80s. So you know, and maybe it's too soon, as you say, Dale. We are, it's too soon to evaluate if it's a revolution or not, but it seems to. Hi, uh, first of all, thank you for your speeches, they're interesting. I have a very basic question. Uh, could you give us some examples of objects or areas where we 3D printing will be used so we can project what kind of uh, things we can do in 30 years or so? In 30 years? Oh, 10 years or... Um, one thing I think is important um, that we not only look at the kind of narrow 3D printing issue, um, but that we, that we uh, sort of widen the scope and, and look at the various technologies that really are available through, through that uh, direct digital manufacturing, as we call it. So, um, you know, 30 years down the line, probably technology will, has, will have shifted quite a bit. Materials will have shifted quite a bit. So we need to take into account um, all, all these uh, developments, plus the new developments that are now happening in the labs with like intelligent matter, reprogrammable matter, that kind of thing, biomimicry on a, on a molecular uh, um, level. So 30 years down the line, I would speculate that we're not talking about 3D printing anymore because it has become so common that we digitally manufacture um, all, almost anything. 30 years down the line, we will be amazed by uh, matter that we sort of can program and that grows things like we today grow human organs. Like, as, as Neil uh, Gershenfeld says, turning data into things and things into data, actually. So I, it, that's a great, I, 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 I'm sorry for, for stopping this discussion because I will stay here like for a week, but uh, maybe we have some other content coming up and maybe someone will kick me out of the stage. I want to thank you very much for the high quality discussion that you bring on the stage or to wish it first today. And thanks for everybody for participating. Make a great applause, thanks.